It's like going from the nation state environment of uh, who can command and control the best, going to a, a digital nation state environment, which is who has the best carrots, uh, and which has got to be a sense and respond. Like who can sense the needs of their constituents the best and respond to the needs of their constituents the best. Welcome to Layer Zero. Layer Zero is a podcast of unscripted conversations with the people that make up the Ethereum community. Crypto is built by code, but is composed by people, and each individual member of the crypto community has their own story to tell. Cypherpunks understood that the code they write impacts the people that use it, and Layer Zero focuses on the people behind the code because Ethereum is people all the way down, and it always has been. Today on Layer Zero, I'm talking with Tracheopteryx. He has been on a number of podcasts talking about very big cerebral topics about DAOs, DAO coordination, um, how DAO uh, coordination mimics nature. And this is all stuff that just really gets my mind going. And I just love all of these very just like far out subjects, as you can tell if you've been listening to the Layer Zero podcast. So we talk about how the one of the most underappreciated lens for viewing this crypto industry is one of biology, how DAOs will have biomimicry in their organizational structure, and how just uh, computers will become part of humans, as we know, like we're building out AI, but it's not going to be external to us, it's going to be a part of us, like our DAOs. And so we are just creating these technologically enabled futures, these technologically enabled humans uh, with AI, but also with DAOs, and DAOs being one of these stories. Uh, we talk about how uh, DAOs, can help change society from being one of command and control to one of being sense and respond. And how does that change culture when our organizations, our institutions don't have this scarcity mentality of resource competition, but instead have this competition of how best can they sense the needs of their constituents and respond to the needs of their constituents with the best possible carrot? Uh, there's so many different angles of this conversation that I thoroughly enjoyed with Tracheopteryx, so I think you will also enjoy this conversation as well. So let's go ahead and get right into this conversation. But first, a moment to talk about some of these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible. If you're trying to grow and preserve your crypto wealth, optimizing your taxes is just as lucrative as trying to find the next hidden gem. Alto IRA can help you invest in crypto in tax advantage ways to help you preserve your hard earned money. Alto Crypto IRA lets you invest in more than 150 coins and tokens with all the same tax advantages of an IRA. They make it easy to fund your alternative IRA or crypto IRA via your 401k or by contributing directly from your bank account. There is no setup or account fees and it's all you need to do to invest in crypto tax tax-free. Let me repeat that again. You can invest in crypto tax-free. Diversify like the pros and trade without tax headaches. Open an Alto Crypto IRA to invest in crypto tax-free. Just go to altoira.com slash bankless. That's A-L-T-O-I-R-A dot com slash bankless and start investing in crypto today. The Layer 2 era is upon us. Ethereum's Layer 2 ecosystem is growing every day, and we need bridges to be fast and efficient in order to live a Layer 2 life. Across is the fastest, cheapest, and most secure cross-chain bridge. With Across, you don't have to worry about the long wait times or high fees to get your assets to the chain of your choice. Assets are bridged and available for use almost instantaneously. Across bridges are powered by UMA's optimistic oracle to securely transfer tokens from Layer 2 back to Ethereum. A token proposal is being deliberated as we speak in the Across forum, where community members will decide Side on the token distribution. You can have your part of Across's story by joining the Discord and becoming a co-founder and helping to design the fair, fair launch of Across. If you want to bridge your assets quickly and securely, go to across.to to bridge your assets between Ethereum, Optimism, Arbitrum, or Boba networks. Arbitrum is an Ethereum Layer 2 scaling solution that's going to completely change how we use DeFi and NFTs. Over 300 projects have already deployed to Arbitrum and the DeFi and NFT ecosystems are growing rapidly. Some of the coolest and newest NFT collections have chosen Arbitrum as their home, all the while DeFi protocols continue to see increased usage and liquidity. Using Arbitrum has never been easier, especially with the ability to deposit directly into Arbitrum through all the exchanges, including Binance, FTX, Huobi, and Crypto.com. Once inside, you'll notice Arbitrum increases Ethereum speed by orders of magnitude for a fraction of the cost of the average gas fee. If you're a developer who wants low gas fees and instant transactions for your users, visit arbitrum.io slash developer to start building your dApp on Arbitrum. If you're a DGEN, many of your favorite dApps on Ethereum are already on Arbitrum with many moving over every day. Go to bridge.arbitrum.io now to start bridging over your ETH and other tokens in order to experience DeFi and NFTs in the way it was always meant to be. Fast, cheap, secure, and friction-free. What's up, Drake? How's it going? Good man, how are you? 
Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, you've been on the, uh, the podcast circuit lately. Uh, and, and I think everyone is, uh, realizing that you have a lot of interesting things to say. Uh, and so I'm bringing you on this podcast cause I think I can do it better. <laughs> Let's do it. That's great. Thank you. Uh, I, I've said it a few times on the show before, but I think the most underappreciated lens for viewing this industry is biology. Uh, and that's why I appreciate your takes the most is because we're looking towards nature for guidance more than just trying to, you know, top down architects, you know, create this thing without any, you know, kind of feeling around in the dark, right? Like crypto, it's a new frontier. We don't really know what we're doing here. We, we get some semblance of an idea. Uh, but I think looking to nature is one of the best guiding, guiding lights that we have in, in this industry. I'm wondering your thoughts on that to kick this conversation going. Absolutely. And, and just in general, I, I'm, I'm always looking at ways to expand my perspective and like step back and see things from another, another angle. And I think, you know, we can get so caught up in what we're doing. It's just everything's within this one little space and becomes tautological or something. And it's all just in here. And then, you know, biology is one bigger lens we can look at. And there's many, many others to step back and, you know, reframe the, the context of what we're doing. Do you remember uh, like a first early moment or aha moment where you were like, hey, this crypto thing relates to nature pretty well? Do, do you remember the first realization you had with that? Uh, yeah, let's see. Um, I think it was basically right right away. Like I, um, um, I've always been interested in, you know, uh, developmental psychology and, and, and bio and physics and various sciences. And I tend to like see echoes of things everywhere. And so I think, um, you know, one of the things that really drew me to, to crypto is DAOs. That was the thing that really, from the beginning, that, that idea. And to me, that was always part of a kind of, I guess, biological framing, like, or at least how I, how it resonated with me. And was it strictly like the org structure of DAOs or how, how DAOs coordinate you thought was going to be like nature, mimicking nature in some way, or, or what was the angle? Well, I guess just I've never really agreed with this idea that we're different than other things, you know, <laughs> like, like, it's all like, okay, so we have computers and we have technology, but really, that's just a, another extension of the phenotype. That's another part of, of this organism. Um, it's all kind of where you draw the circle and how you draw a boundary around something, what you define the self, like, it gets very confusing. You look at bees or at ant colonies or at saphonophores or all of these different or the bacteria in your gut or whatever. And this notion of identity really melts away as soon as you kind of interrogate it. And so, um, yeah, like the human condition of, of, of trying to create things and working together. Like I, I ran a, started a bunch of companies and ran teams and things like that. And, and to me, it's always very much about that interpersonal piece. And, um, that always felt like part of some expanding mammal broad set or something, you know, it's always just some like piece of turbulence. And so, you know, the idea that a DAO could put, put this structure together that can hold these types of interpersonal dynamics and this creative energies, you know, was the kind of the, the first thing I thought when I saw them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't, I can't remember where I heard this first, but, uh, if you, if you, if you look like a, at a beehive or an ant colony and you're looking at like the bees and the ants, the organism itself isn't the individual ant or the individual bee. It's the hive itself. Like, uh, it's, it's, which it makes it intangible, which mm -hmm. is kind of cool. Like, there is no actual center of a beehive of the organism. It's just like the whole many, many individual moving parts. Uh, and when you talk about the self, like, you can even get into the human body and talk about our individual selves. Like, we yep. have our body, which is our container, but our cells come and go. Our brain cells come and go. Uh, and like, and you alluded to it, like your, your gut microbiome, which is a very critical part of who you are, literally is not part of you. Uh, and how, how have you extended this concept of what is alive to Dows? Like what is alive with a Dow? Well, you, it's, you can very easily get into kind of like semantic corruption here by, by stretching the, the definition Dow, but let's not worry about that for sure. a second and just play with it. And yeah. so you can think about like the Dow within. You can think that just like you say, like it's a little bit more obvious when you look at a beehive, but it's the same problem when you look at a human being. You know, there's a notion of cellular psychology or, you know, and the bacteria and all of these different pieces that that create this colony that is me. Um, and that has a lot of the same kind of 
relationships, dynamics as a organization has. And you can look at a, a, a company like Apple, or, you, you know, and you, and you can think of that as a life form. Uh, you really, you really can. I mean, the definition of life is pretty flexible, and you can at least it's worth you know the curious thought experiment of thinking about it that way, and think about what it if you draw the boundary of life around that organism, what does that do, and how does that function, and then around a DAO, and just keep drawing different circles and seeing how they they compare. Yeah, I, the the way that I try and like understand uh, if something is alive or not is is uh, if it is self interested in its own well being. Right. And so Apple certainly self-interested in its own well-being. Right. And will take both defensive and aggressive moves in order to make sure that it stays alive. And so, like, you know, if, if it's self-interested and it's actionable, uh, it is alive, like whether it's like a, a cell or an, a, a company uh, or a DAO. Uh, and, and I think like when, when life begins, like when some sort of life form forms, like you, we started off as singular cellular organisms, but then we started depending on like newer structures onto these cells that could sense the the world around it, right? Like receive inputs and allow it to process data. Uh, and so I, I think what a lot of like what your uh, work has been doing over at, at Coordinate is like building out like one of the first appendages that allows DAOs to like receive inputs to make sure that the DAO can know about the information that it needs to know in order to self-perpetuate its own ideas into the future. How do you feel about this? Yeah, I, I love it. I mean, whenever I'm building things, I'm thinking about biology and science fiction and fucking spirits and all the different weird things, <laughs> you know, like, like <laughs> that's the, the terrain I'm, I'm, I'm walking. And, um, mm -hmm. so like with, with coordinate, yeah, I think of it like that, like an organ, you know, um, mm -hmm. And particularly, like, I love this idea of sense and respond, which I, I think I heard from Zach Anderson first, who's a, a co-founder of Coordinate, which is a totally different kind of modality for operating, you know, rather than um, just command and control. Uh, this this kind of dichotomy is one I often use, like, where most corporations and nations about command and control, this idea that, wait, we can actually work in a different way, which is, like, listen and react, you know, sense and respond. And, like, what a... What a tools look like? What do apps look like that are designed in that way and to support that kind of interpersonal anti-rivalrous behavior? Do you have any just thoughts about like what society looks like when it migrates from a command and control dominated version of coordination versus a sense and respond like version of coordination? Like if we all, if we all shift on the spectrum from command and control to a sense and respond, like what, how would society be different? Well, I think the first thing is that we won't like there's we won't all do that, right? And like there's always just a super heterogeneous, diverse population of people. There's always going to be people that are in a rivalrous mentality. There's always going to be people that um, you know, are in scarcity ideas, and uh, and, and that's okay. Uh, I think it's but to the to the point of your question, I think there it does become a threshold where there's enough people that are starting to work in this sense and respond, uh, abundance mindset, um, that things really do start to change. And, um, and I really like, uh, one of my, you know, kind of favorite thinkers, Ken Wilber talks about, you know, in the, in the sixties, there was a similar kind of big mindset change, uh, the countercultural movement, you know, which he, uh, looks at as being this kind of developmental tier, this kind of pluralistic intelligence or the sensitive, uh, intelligence. And, um, and because about like, you know, 10% of the world around that time started to have this level of, of development, it created these huge systemic changes. And mm -hmm. I think we're at a similar, you know, not just me, a lot of uh, mm -hmm. people I've read and others think that we're at a kind of similar fulcrum right now. And that this new level of development, this new intelligent kind of integral or sense and respond or non-rivalrous is starting to get enough. Uh, there's enough people with running this operating system you know, that things like, you know, the DAOs and the, that we work in happen. Uh, you, you indicated that, like, the whole command and control type of uh, uh, modality is uh, one of, of a scarcity mindset. Uh, mm. Is that is that true? Or, or like, can, can you go into that? Why, why is command and control a scarcity mindset? And why is sensor and spawn abundance? Yeah, that's a good question. So I can't say that they are both, ab like, synonymous, but I think mm -hmm. they tend to align more. So like, what's the point, right? Like it kind of goes back to that, just that question. What's the point? Um, what, what worldview are we operating from? 
You know, if you're operating from a worldview where you're going to die unless you take this other dude's shit, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, uh, a command and control like program makes a little bit more sense. It's like, let me control all the variables, make sure that I'm safe, you know, create a strategy that I can then execute to get the reward and then I'm good. And the thing about those strategies first is that they're really closed. It's like in my little brain, my little view of things, like I can control all the variables and like probabilistically I'm going to get the thing that I want and that's going to be good. Like when I get that scarce resource now, I've won. But we know that that's never really the case. You just want another scarce resource and another scarce resource and that doesn't actually solve the problem you're trying to say it solve. If you come from a different worldview, um, one that's more about the journey than the destination, sense and respond makes a, a lot more sense. Um, and I think it tends, I have to think about this more, but I, I think you could use sense and respond in a scarcity dynamic as a type of strategy. Um, but um, I think it's more natural fit for different kinds. Yeah. Um, a sense and respond organism, whether it's like, something as small as a, a bee or us humans or something as large as like an organization, corporation or, or nation state, sense and respond seems to have connotations of like empathy and yes. yeah. cooperation. Uh, and cer certainly I think it would be, I, I think I could say without, without, you know, too much evidence that people, the culture of today uh, is we are looking for institutions and corporations that have more empathy uh, I think it's something that yes. uh, a lot of like perhaps the left, but like re re has really nailed down. But I think we're all kind of looking for it is that like these ultra capitalist, like late stage capitalist, uh, large corporations are all lacking empathy. Right. And maybe it's because they're all operating on this command and control paradigm and they don't have this sense and respond paradigm. Uh, so there's a thought. If you have any reflections on that one, go ahead. Yeah. Um, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's. Very true, and uh, there's a lot of ways to look at that. Um, first of all, it can be strategically advantage, advantageous to like numb your own empathy if you're in a really hostile environment. Mm. So, mm. like, there's nothing wrong. First is like, you know, if people haven't developed empathy or they're functioning in a kind of low empathy environment, like, I don't want to cast any blame or shame there. Like that, that can be the best thing you, that right. that person needs to do. Um, and you know, I think a lot of the systemic issues in the world do come from a, a lack of empathy. I mean, what are we talking? We're talking about coordination issues. How do we, how do we share resources together? And if you, if, you know, if we're playing the resource game, resource war game, you know, then, um, you know, we're really depleting the resources on the planet too fast. And I think, um, you know, it also goes to notions of divine masculine and feminine. And, and the, I don't mean female sex, male sex. I mean, right you know, the idea of, you know, recepting and transmitting and listening and speaking. And, um, and the world has been really dominated by a kind of masculine energy for the past long time. I don't know, <laughs> thousand years or something. And, um, that's manifested through nations con conquest and corporations conquest and command and control are both these very like, you know, emissive, like controlling ideas of subjugating, uh, you know, things. Um, whereas sensing is more receptive. It's more, more the divine feminine and also just more the feminine energy that each of us can source within ourselves, um, that the world is in kind of dire need for, which also tends to be more empathic because you're, you're listening. Mm -hmm. Uh, do, do you know if we've ever had a paradigm of sense and respond before? Uh, you, you alluded to like uh, the counterculture revolution in the '60s and how that mm. became, you know, a, a came a very com a strong component of society. But I don't think it necessarily resulted in a complete phase shift from command and control to sense and respond. Do you know if we've ever had a society of that was dominated by sense and respond? It's a really good question. I mean, I think um, from the little I've read about you know uh, tribal communities, um, I think there's some examples in those types of, uh, of networks where it, it is much more like, you know, you have a really strong matriarchy and a really strong patriarchy and they both have different roles in the community. And then you have shaman and you have outliers and, you know, all together the tribe becomes this kind of organism that mm -hmm. can work in balance with the world. So sense and response is much more about balance. Like, mm -hmm. um, so much of the command and control stuff that's happened has been about the opposite of balance, about conquest. Right. 
you know, expansion mm-hmm. by all means, cancerous growth by all means. Um, but that's part of that, you know, critical operating system change is to get into a mode of balance with the environment and each other. Right. So, uh, if you're, if I'm interpreting your answer correctly, you just said like, we haven't had like a, a strong dominance of sense and response since we were hunter gatherers, which was, you know, many, many, many thousands of years ago is basically before we invented any meaningful amount of technology, right? Like the first version of technology we really invented was the agricultural revolution. And it's been command and control ever since. It's been concrete. It's been the resource game. It's been playing the the resource game aggressively ever since then. Yeah, that's, I mean, I certainly don't have a comprehensive knowledge of everything here, but that sure. sounds right. right in a lot of ways. And, you know, I, I was thinking about this the other day, talking to Kevin Iwaki, like, um, that, um, you know, from from the moment of agriculture, like there's some interesting research showing that like when agriculture was developed, we stopped being hunter gatherers. We started having, uh, you know, need to be rooted in certain areas. And then all of a sudden this notion of paternity certainty became important. Whereas mm-hmm. before there was much more kind of free love and, and families like um, mm-hmm. raise the children's tribes, raise the children's together. All of a sudden now you have property and you need to staff that property and you staff that property with your children. Uh, and so you need to know who your children are. You know, all of a sudden there's the notion of labor and a workforce right at the beginning. And I think you, you maybe we can, we can say like, look, there's this kind of, you know, all of a sudden masculine right. imbalance that emerges. Oh, that's super interesting. Right. Okay. So going from hunter gatherers to agricultural revolution uh, is w- uh, we stopped moving around as society and st- the action of s- stopping and like planting ourselves into one place on the earth because that's where we would need to grow food, right? Like you can't move your farm. So all of a sudden we stopped being nomadic and we stopped, we started being fixed and that allowed people to have more things uh, because uh, then we didn't have to move with them. We could just keep them you know, in our huts, in our houses. Uh, and then we established property uh, and then that turned the resource game into like the next level, right? Where it's, it's m- more than the things we can carry on our backs. It's like the things around us. Uh, and then all of a sudden that kicked off a much more uh, aggressive and less holistically coordinated uh, so version of society is—is is this the right conclusion to to be tracking on? I, let's go with this because I think this there's a lot of far out ideas that come from this. So we can say that there's been this kind of arc in in history that has started from that transmission transition to agriculture, where all of a sudden you're like locked in a location, all the way right. to let's say even 2020, where I love this thing Balaji wrote, which was that 2020 was the first year that we became digital first citizens. You know, yeah. And I think that that was this kind of germination event of of um of covid that forced us all to like move into this new territory of the digital network and mm-hmm. the crazy thing is it is that that uh starts to change that constraint of place because we've been really stuck into this notion of place and property for 10,000 years um and so if we want like let's say that that's the arc that we've just come to the end of a 10,000 year arc mm-hmm. in human evolution and now there's this opportunity to move around more, you know, like, but move around in this digital space, which has totally new properties. And, you know, when I think about this comes kind of goes back to DAOs, DAOs, you know, this idea of cloud nations too, that we'll be able to create these digital societies. And like, look, there's lots of questions about that, but we're already creating them. But um, one cool thing is a kind of modular politics where, mm-hmm. um, you know, if, uh, DAOs or digital communities can start to intermediate uh, between governance, uh, legacy government like nation states and corporations and start to take more power and hold more power, which I think they will because they can outcompete financially in many ways, then um, it will be able to have this ability to choose our allegiance very easily without moving our physical location, which is like uh, actually goes back to this interesting idea I learned about a number of years ago seasteading by uh, Patrick Friedman was um, this, this really I, the idea of the kind of modular politics that the reason that we're fucked is that, you know, we can't move very easily. The cost of moving is so high, so you can't change your politics. But if everybody would live on a boat and we just tied the boats up into a giant island in the ocean, then you could just sail your boat to a different political island if you wanted to, to like, mm-hmm. you know, but we don't have to have boats. We can just do it on on blockchain. Right, right. Yeah. The uh, every single DAO or every single like 
nation state in the cloud is inherently opt in, right? Like no, nothing yeah. can force you to become a part of it. This is something that's also in the in the sovereign individual where all these nation states compete on monopolies of violence, as in like who can have the strongest armies? Because if you have the strongest army, then you control the world. Uh, and so something I actually got out of Bitcoiners in their reaction to their very, very strong reaction to COVID is that like a lot of countries started like locking in their citizens. Like you couldn't leave Australia for for like two years almost uh, without like a lot of friction. And really the only people that could leave Australia are the wealthy or the people that are wealthy enough to afford it, you know, being able to like lock themselves into a, a, ho a hotel for two weeks because that was a quarantine protocol. And Australia wasn't the only one. That was like a lot of countries like that. Uh, and, so, and like as the arc of nation states comes to an end, they get more aggro with controlling their property. And one of their nation state properties is their hu humans that live inside of them. Like that's where they get their tax money from. And so the arc of nation states is as they kind of come to the end of their lifespan, they start to clamp down harder and harder and harder on taxes and on their citizens. Uh, meanwhile, I, and I think we all kind of feel like we're coming towards the end of the nation state arc. Nation state arc. Meanwhile, we're creating these digital nation states, which are inherently opt in, which we can choose to align with based on our own personal values. And one of my talks at uh, ETH Denver was about how uh, Web3 protocols are going to compete for our love because of this opt in forcing function, they can only compete with our love for our love because they don't have any other, they only have carrots. They don't have any sticks, right? And so it's inherently uh, a sense and respond competitive environment. It's like going from the nation state environment of uh, who can command and control the best, going to a, a digital nation state environment, which is who has the best carrots uh, and which has got to be a sense and respond, like who can sense the needs of their constituents the best and respond to the needs of their constituents the best. Yeah. I mean, it's a much more sovereign kind of place mm -hmm. to be. Right. And um, I think, you know, you, you can look back and you can see this kind of trajectory of these different dominant coordination methodologies, basically like, or, or phenomena, like religion for a long time was the dominant coordination story on the planet like most of the human interpersonal relationships were mediated through that fiction of religion um but that didn't go away when the nation state started to rise to dominance like just it started to take some of that coordination function into its sphere and then the same thing happened with the privatization of so many services through corporations you know private prisons and private ser services everything like that and i think we're going to start to see the same thing now with uh on with web3 and for instance, privatization of, of governance and politics and public goods uh, can all be better, you know, coordinated through these substrates. It's a really big claim, right? And and yeah. I, I love the idea. And it makes sense to me if we zoom out and look at this industry from the 100 year time frames like, oh, yeah, DAOs will eventually be able to coordinate global resources and coordinate governance way better than nation states. But then it, it feels like one of those things where it's like, you know, step one, create a DAO. Step two, question mark, question mark, question mark. Yeah, step yeah. three, uh, we Profit. control the world. Like <laughs> yeah. this, this, the step two thing, I'm really confused about. <laughs> Don't worry about the details, man. We got this covered. <laughs> Just sign, sign your check right here, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you have any ideas? That's like, what is like the first few steps we need in order to actually unbundle the role of the nation state? Yeah, I mean, I have some ideas and I think... Um, I think the important thing is like we're really early, right? Like, so we're having all these grand ideas, and that's great. <laughs> you know, that's that's it's inspiring. Step we're one: all like, make podcasts. <laughs> yeah, like we're like people are asking me to talk about this stuff. I don't know what the <laughs> fuck I'm saying. I'm just spouting bullshit. And like, there's all these beautiful sci-fi fantasy ideas, and like those are great. Those are let's not forget about the value of those. And look, why why are they coming up? Because we're seeing some like some hook, some anchor in this stuff that we don't know shit about yet. But we're like, maybe, right. maybe, maybe, right? Um, but now I think one of the things, and I'm starting to do this work with a, a couple of people now, is to really look at um, the um, the problems, like in, in really, really, really high detail, like um, like Daniel Schmachtenberger's work and Jordan Hall on the meta crisis. And so working with those guys and like, like can we define um, the nature of the kind of systemic problem because it's so can it's so hard to figure out like um we that's a long rabbit hole but just defining what the problems are and then what the design constraints are for solving them and then seeing like hey do DAOs like can we provably say that DAOs have the 
mechanisms or can they have they shown um, potential for solving these problems? Because we're stuck in this, um, you know, bad Nash equilibrium right now where, you know, in this nation state, you know, resource right. war corporate world that we can't get out of. Right. Do DAOs really fundamentally change that equilibrium? Um, and we have to actually do the work of proving that. So, okay, we're like, it's still Kool-Aid time. That's fine. Not going to knock right. it. It's great. I drink it too. And we have to like really drill down now. Right, right. Um, I'm going to ask you the same question. Like, hmm. where do we start? Like, what oh, is yeah. the first thing that we do? With that, that What's the first W that DAOs have that's going to like wake up the rest of the world to be like, oh, okay, that's a real thing now? Oh, let's see. Um, well, I think we're already starting to see some of them. You know, like um, like these massive kind of flash DAOs that coordinate to buy historical relics and and other things like that. I think that's that's interesting, but that's just like kind of like one little like, oh wow, what's that? Um, and we're seeing these you know DeFi DAOs that are you know doing these incredibly financial things that are creating. It's like, oh, that's interesting. Um, but you know, we're not solving major governance problems yet, right? Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't suggest that you know, apply a DAO to the actual governance of a of a political territory yet. But um, I think we're going to start seeing some uh, some impact there, like. You could imagine some cases where you use DAOs or, or, or Web3 coordination to start to become part of it, not just through like donating to Ukraine, but like through some type of decision making or some type of public policy sense making. Um, I think that potentially one way that we start to really see more provable goods. Yeah, yeah. I was talking with uh, Tarun on a layer zero and, and he had the idea that um, the, the first way we do this is actually through the financial industry. Uh, so like um, the financial industry is all lawyers and contracts. And so like you put money into the financial industry, it goes through a lawyer written contract and then it goes out and turns into finance, right? Like mm -hmm. all finance is, is the combination of contracts and money. That's why mm -hmm. smart contracts are really cool. That's how DeFi exists. But importantly, like a lot of, uh, he, he, he talks about how like a lot of the financial industry can be unbundled and like, um, uh, put on and and start to use like crypto rails and not and I'm not talking about just creating DeFi like like disintermediating Wall Street. What I'm talking about is like some certain like financial contracts need to have the price of something in the in the contract, right? And so the price of something could be in that contract could reference something like a Uniswap Oracle, right? Uh, and then it's the Uniswap Oracle that becomes the arbiter of truth. Uh, and we can start to like, you know, expand on this. And all of a sudden the financial industry is being made easier because it's tapping into the truth of DeFi rather than just like hard coding it into their manually inputted smart contract. Uh, and then all of a sudden the, the financial industry back end starts to become whatever the state on Ethereum is. Mm. Uh, and then, and then we kind of go from there. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the kind of like the disruptive innovation model where like it just we're starting to do work in this space that, you know, isn't the same territory that the traditional model has, has taken and it all of a sudden becomes useful and it's a better product and they start to use it for things and all of a sudden eats away at the whole system. Mm -hmm. I can see that happening. Sure. Yeah. Well, your talk at ETH Denver was really interesting because you, you gave a bunch of like, um, uh, I don't know what, like, like, it felt like, like a scan of a, of an organism, right? And, uh, like, really unbundled, and you could see the different parts of the organism and the, the functioning roles. And you map that out into like a metaphor. It's like, well, this part of the organism is like this part of the DAO, right? And this part of the organism is like this part of the DAO. Uh, and w w one thing I think that we're seeing is that, like, DAOs are kind of a little bit of the, the epicenter for a lot of things in crypto. It's like, first we had DeFi protocols and then separately we had DAOs. And then all of a sudden in like the, uh, the DeFi summer, what that really was, was the smashing of these two particles together. I was just like, let's put the DeFi protocol into the DAO and like have this same thing, right? And we're actually seeing Element Finance do that right now. So they just launched their token. Uh, so now the Element DeFi application is now being put together with the Element DAO, but they're also pending on an NFT project. And so now, like, what is Element? Is it really a DeFi project? Because now it's also a DAO, but it also has its own NFT ecosystem. And so now, like, this DAO has, like, three 
appendages. Like it's got the prefrontal cortex, which is the DAO. That's the decision making. Uh, then you've got like the the digestive system, which is how the DAO gets energy, which is the DeFi app. Uh, but then you have like the the cultural expression, which is like the NFT thing. Uh, and so like these are the three things. And and I think like for every single thing that we invent in this crypto space, like the DAO will be at the epicenter and we'll just keep on like appending all of these things into how, and then boom, we have an organism that is like a, a sense and, and feel and respond type organism. Uh, yeah. Thoughts on, thoughts on that. And you can, can you also kind of just give listeners who haven't listened to your, uh, your uh, East Denver talk, just like a, a taste of what that was about? Yeah. I was talking a lot about different like biological models for decision-making and minds basically. Like, um, like you can look at, so the amazing thing about Web3 is we have these like kind of unconstrained networks. Like you can, all these different people can come together and work on things in whatever way you want in a much, much more free and open topography than we're used to in a corporation, let's say, uh, where there's very strict, often roles and reporting and everything. But now it's everybody swarm together and do something. And so like what type of nature of mind does this create? Like, you know, you, you can look at the corporate uh, kind of model for a mind. And I kind of uh, use the metaphor of a robot there where you have like a sensor processing unit and you have sensors that send information up the direct report to the processor makes decisions and then sends electrical impulses to the actuators that then execute it exactly versus like a slime mold, which is more like a DAO where just everything is sensing and responding and, and, and moving and making decisions based on whatever it's seeing around it. And then there's things in between too, like um, the, I think the thing you're referencing was the siphonophore, which is a colonial organism. It looks like a kind of jellyfish, but it has like four or five different species that are all in a really strongly coupled symbiotic relationship together so that they fit together like one organism, which is just wild, um, which to Whoa. me felt a lot like, like Dow's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Can you yeah. go, can you just elaborate on that? Uh, to tell us, tell me more about that. How does that yeah, work? I, I actually don't know. That, organisms? I don't know that much more about it, uh, sadly. Um, <laughs> but like, I've imagined a lot about it, so I can speculate a lot about it. But um, all I know, like factually, is that it is a like it's a, a, a colonial organism they call it, which is made up of multiple different species, but that all function together as a team as one that looks and acts like one animal. Uh -huh. But. You know, you could say that about the human being in a sense. You say that right. we got bacteria, right? But this is a little bit like more far out because you can like see each different animal and they're all kind of like fitting together um, to like float around like a like a little guy. Um, that is nuts. How many like you know. uh, so the these things all have to be like born around each other so that they can find each other? Like, how does that process work? Do you know about I that? I mean, can we get an expert on to help us with this? Because <laughs> I, I, I have the same no, questions. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. Okay. Uh, yeah. But I think the, the model to extrapolate this to DAOs is that like, um, there's a lot of overlapping DAOs these days, like Bankless DAO, very tapped into Metafactory mm -hmm. DAO, which is like, and, and so like, yeah. is, is this kind of the idea where just like, we're actually going to thrive not by solo DAOs doing well for each other, but just by absolutely sh sharing resources and sharing capabilities and just hooking into each other. Well, I think that the whole like kind of um, physics and friction of the work decentralized of the work space changes with blockchain and with mm -hmm. Web three, right? And um, you know, Jack DeRose wrote beautifully about this, talking about the uh, Coase article, nineteen thirty seven article, the nature of the firm, in which this you know economist defines like why vertical integration basically is a good idea at that time. It's because of the overhead and, the, you know, you benefit from centralization. Why not just a bunch of independent actors work together? At that time, there was no um, open public goods infrastructure to allow for that to happen. So you have these monopolies arise. But now we have this open public goods infrastructure that can allow for decentralized work to and where independent sovereign agents can come together and do stuff. And like, as we're starting to like skate out onto this new ice, we don't really understand it. So what you see is a lot of um, corporations on the blockchain, for for lack of a better term. They're just you know repeating the same model that we know, but doing it in this new space. But there's also ones that are trying lots of new weird things. Um, and what we're seeing is that the idea of like a corporate entity kind of doesn't make much sense anymore. At least in, mm -hmm. like what I'm seeing more is these permeable networks where you have like the Yearn protocol and the Coordinate protocol and the Curve protocol and the Bankless DAO protocols and and but there's people that are in all of them kind of working together and working for multiple at the same time. And the DAOs are collaborating together. They're often 
you know, directly interacting between the protocols. So it's this kind of big open mess. Um, mm -hmm. And like the, uh, the kind of nature of work change, the work group, the, the boundaries, the surface tension changes. Instead of being this big hard boundary around a 10, 30,000 person company and it can't be the same as this other one. Right. Now it's this little one. Non-complete yeah. clauses. Yeah. You yeah. can't, you like, like you only work for one corporation at a time, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't blah, matter blah. anymore. Yeah. Right. And, and the coolest thing too is like, you know, it, it, it does, I believe that it does become anti-rivalrous in that, um, a better strategy in this environment is to be composable and open and collaborative than competitive and closed. Like you will make more money and have a more successful product product if you take that strategy. Yeah. And you can actually see that, uh, concretely in that a lot of uh, DAO discords have channels in them that hook straight into other DAOs mm -hmm. discords, right? Like these are actually yeah. hard coded bridges that we have in our communication coordination tools, which is what discord is. It's basically DAO yeah. coordination. I was, I was kind of blown away with that when I first joined Yearn like a couple years ago and like the main like chat at that time, you know, there were leaders of like 10 of the other top protocols. And that time I was like, wow, this is like the headquarters and like it's people from all over DeFi in here, all doing it together. It's like, like, like wow, this is wild. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, uh, I, I wrote an article I, all the way back in like 2019, I think, that was uh, called, uh, I can't remember what it's called. Uh, it's basically arguing that DeFi is not just one thing. Like you don't have the Uniswap app. You don't have the, uh, your didn't even exist at the time. Uh, you don't have just MakerDAO. You don't have just Compound. But like over time, the composability of these things, like die from Maker goes into Uniswap, allowing you to go in. You can also get like C tokens out of Compound. And all of a sudden, like it's not just one DeFi app at a time. It's one DeFi superstructure. Like these are yeah. all composability means all these things are coming together. And if you actually are not composable, then you're left out. And if you're not composable, like there's an insane amount of value and economic activity going on in the superstructure. So if you're not part of the superstructure, you're just not going to make it, right? Because you, it's advantageous to be a part of the superstructure to contribute your value to this superstructure so that you can pull some of that value back out. And so you can start to be part of this like positive feedback loop of composability. And I think what we're seeing is the same thing with is going to work with DAOs, where DAOs are just going to become one sort of massive superstructure of DAOs. And we're all going to support each other, like kind of individually. DAOs won't work; like they're too messy, mm -hmm. they're too chaotic. But when you put fifty DAOs all in the same spot and you have a lot of overlapping talent and labor, people can start to like meld these things together and bootstrap themselves. Yeah. And I, I, it goes to the question of like, what are we doing here anyways? Like, mm -hmm. I think we've all gotten really gaslit into this idea that you're supposed to work hard every day and make the product and make the money and like mm -hmm. serve the boss. And like, why? Like, yes, we need food. We need uh, to pick up trash and, and things like this. Like all those things still exist and are real. And it doesn't require that logic of like, um, Conquest, really, you know, and like mm -hmm. we have to, I have to make my shit so other people can't take it and I have to build the walls and I'm going to like have my business plan and sign an NDA and like, no, that's not the only way to be productive, creative and happy in the world. Like this, the, the logic of blockchain and of open source software and the internet creates a really different environment to thrive in, mm -hmm. which yeah. corresponds to a, a change in global consciousness that's right. in the same way, right? All right. Now this is this is the layer zero. Like as soon yeah. as we have enough DAOs to, if not accept everyone as laborers, but to accept everyone as at least consumers of whatever the DAOs got to give, mm -hmm. uh, the idea the idea is that it it flips people, it inverts people's mental models as to like how they exist on this world. It's like don't you know you don't got to work for your nine to five. You just got to give the protocol what it wants. And if you don't like giving that protocol what you what it wants, find a different one. Uh, yeah. and f uh, keep doing that until you find your place. And all of a sudden, boom, you're in web three. And what's, what's magic about this. It's like, it's really profound that change really. And it's really new for a lot of people. Like, mm -hmm. um, and it can be really confronting for a lot of people too, because a lot of us only have this experience of like our parents or our bosses or our society telling us what's good. And what we're mm -hmm. supposed to do. And then you have this ladder that's consensual and you climb it and you, you know, you check the boxes and now you've done a good job. Good boy. Right. But mm -hmm. now we don't have that really as much. And all of a sudden we have to say, well, 
why am I doing any of this anyways? Um, and that's like profoundly valuable for personal and ecological development. MakerDAO is the OG DeFi protocol. The MakerDAO produces DAI, the industry's most battle-tested and resilient stablecoin. Using Maker, you don't need to sell your collateral if you need liquidity. Instead, you can spin up a Maker Vault and use your collateral to mint DAI directly. With Maker, the power to mint new money is in your hands. The Maker protocol is extremely hardened and operated by one of the most experienced DAOs in existence. They've been here since the beginning, they've seen it all, and so you can mint DAI with the assurance that your collateral is safe. Soon, Maker will be present on all chains and L2s, so minting DAI can take place on Oasis.app, Zerion, Zapper, or any other DeFi protocol that you use. Follow Maker on Twitter, at MakerDAO, and learn from the oldest and most resilient DAO in existence. Aave is the leading decentralized liquidity protocol, and now Aave v3 is here. Aave v3 has powerful new features to enable you to get the most out of DeFi, including isolation mode, which allows for many more markets to be launched with more exotic collateral types, and also efficiency mode, which allows for higher loan-to-value ratios, and of course, portals, allowing users to port their Aave position across all of the networks that Aave operates on, like Polygon, Phantom, Avalanche, Arbitrum, Optimism, and Harmony. The beautiful thing about Aave is that it's completely completely open source, decentralized, and governed by its community, enabling a truly bankless future for us all. To get your first crypto collateralized loan, get started at Aave.com, that's A-A-B-E.com, and also check out the Aave Protocol Governance Forums to see what more than 100,000 DAO members are all robbing about at governance.ave.com. The Brave browser is the user-first browser for the Web3 internet, with over 50 million monthly active users. Control your digital footprint with built-in privacy and ad blocking. Inside the Brave browser, you'll find the Brave wallet, the first secure crypto wallet built natively inside of a Web3 crypto browser. Web3 is freedom from big tech and Wall Street, more control and better privacy. But there's a weak point in Web3, your crypto wallet. The Brave wallet is different. Brave wallet is built natively inside the Brave browser, no extension required, which gives the Brave wallet an extra level of security versus other wallets. With the Brave wallet, you can buy, store, send, and swap your crypto assets, and you can even manage your NFTs and connect to other wallets and DeFi apps, all from the security of the best privacy browser on the market. Whether you're new to crypto or a seasoned pro, it's time to switch to the Brave wallet. Download Brave at brave.com slash bankless and click the wallet icon to get started. We've, we've hashed this out a little bit, but I want to go back to it. Um, there's always the conversations with technology is like, you know, uh, right technology, wrong time, like maybe we're too early. What, what indications about the current state of the world uh, would you say that is indicative of like, oh, yeah, the world really wants this new like DAO paradigm, like this new Web3? Like what about the world is like really, really ready for this? Hmm. Well, I can think of so many things, but it's hard to tell if there's like a kind of causal or just correlative relationships. I mean, you can never really know, but, um, you know, the anti-work movement, you know, like mm -hmm. all of all of these people that are so that are so mistreated by the corporate paradigm and getting paid the the, la, the minimum wage being so low comparatively historically, um, then there's you know, a really fascinating thing uh, uh, that happened like in, in with Russia where um, there was a massive network effect at play in you know where it wasn't just that the EU and the US and some Western countries. Um, sanctioned Russia, it was like all these businesses pulled out too. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't um, something that you could like control from one hierarchical position, right? That was a network effect, which is kind of like a DAO. And it turns out that the, at least from some analysis, that that network effect of all of these different agents kind of autonomously deciding to retract their business services, like created a much bigger impact and a much bigger uh, stick, you know, for, for that mm -hmm. behavior. And so it's like, look, like the world is trying to form into these networks anyways. And, mm -hmm. and DAOs and Web3 are like the perfect kind of like network substrate for that activity. So it seems there's that. And then there's also, yeah, just the, you know, global consciousness change of people wanting to be whole beings and confronting this, like our, our parents' generation of like, mm -hmm. um, you know, working hard for the system and the, the, the death of the American dream and, um, seeing how, uh, you know, <laughs> that often doesn't work and, and really wanting something different, wanting to be a whole being, uh, you know, with the, with the people we work with and not just have a, a work mask. Like these things have all been developing independently of, of web three, but they all kind of fit together to support it. Mm. What do you think are the, um, 
the biggest fallacies that we're making right now. Like one thing I'm worried about is like one of the reasons why so many people can work for DAOs these days, whatever that means for that particular mm -hmm. DAO is like, well, I mean, 2021 was really bullish for crypto prices. Like a lot of people are sitting on a, a pile of savings that they perhaps didn't expect to have. Like maybe when these the savings run out, maybe working for a DAO isn't so glorious anymore. Like what, what, what are our fall ups here? What are, where, what are we tripping up on? Well, I think we're making a ton of assumptions is the first thing, but I also think that that's okay. Like, I, I think to assume that we're going to have everything figured out and if like not all the line items are properly annotated, then like this isn't going to work is silly. Like we're at the beginning of a really gigantic change. Like we do not have it figured out. That's fine. We can make some assumptions as long as we do it lightly. Um, so I think the fallacy is one that it's all figured out or that it's not going to work. Both of those are, you know, suitably or similarly wrong. Um, and we don't really know what the financial you know, support is going to be like. If there's, if we don't know the future of the market or the macro global situation. Like who knows? A lot of those things could put, like crypto is not going to be absolutely, definitely turn over the world in the next five years. Like a lot of us believe that, but there's a lot of ways that nation states could um, stop that and sl well, slow it down at least. I mean, you can stop it by killing everybody, um, which could happen. Um, that would work. Yeah, at least it'll delay it for, I mean, if you think of, I tend to think of, of crypto really as a developmental, like from a biological perspective, it is a, is it a, a, a force, it's a part of the force of the development of the universe, right. Uh, right. not something that like one guy is going to figure out. Um, right. So in that sense, you can never stop it because it's always right. the next tier for any civilization, right. but it can certainly be delayed or stopped for thousands of years. Yeah. Yeah. Um. It's a frequent trope in this crypto space is that like, oh yeah, we're trying to onboard like the next 1 billion people into crypto, right? Like this DAO is gonna onboard a billion people or my product is gonna onboard a billion people. And every time I hear that, like everyone loves to say that just because like it's a, it's a fun, like we all want to onboard a billion people, but I'm also at the same time like, bruh, like we do not have the infrastructure to onboard a billion people, man. Like every single blockchain would break. Solana would break, <laughs> Arbitrum would break, like Avalanche would break. There, we literally do not have the block space capacity to onboard a billion people. Uh, and definitely with DAOs, like no, you can't just go work for a DAO. There's not that much room in DAOs in its current state of, of things. Like we just do not have that capacity. And so like one of the reasons why I think a lot of like there's the NFT haters out there, there's like the, the gamers that hate the play to earn gaming revolution. And they just hate all the things that crypto is infiltrating in their industry is like, oh, crypto is infiltrating culture and I hate it. And crypto is infiltrating games and I hate it. And I think just one of the reasons why they hate it is because it's a natural organic reaction saying, hey, your guys aren't ready for me yet. Like mm -hmm. your, your blockchains have high fees and your games are boring and your NFTs are, are shitty. Uh, so what they're really saying is, yo, crypto, go figure your shit out and then I'll, and then come back for me. And I think it's like this natural balancing act of like, we cannot onboard a billion people cause we do not have the capacity for them, but we could onboard like, I don't know, the next thousand in the next month or so. And then yeah. maybe the next 3,000, two months later, uh, and then they're going to help build out some of this stuff. Uh, and then, you know, maybe, maybe the next month after that, we'll get 5,000. Uh, but then it starts to like perpetuate and, and roll out. Uh, and, and so how, how do you feel about like this model for like um, this natural reaction of just like people hate crypto and that's why they're not coming over to us. But it's really just them feed, giving us feedback that like we haven't built out the solutions for them yet. Yeah, I think that that's true. And I think it's okay. Like as much as we all, or many of us really want to see total open, equal access to all of these tools and to onboard everybody and, and bring DAO technology to underserved communities and, and change government, we want to do all these things. And it's also okay to realize that maybe not all these things are ready. You know, the, the, the world is full of all different types of people coming from all different perspectives and we are very privileged in that we've had the education, the opportunity, maybe the, the support, the, the finances um, to engage in this new like space. It, it reminds me of the often used William Gibson reference, like the future is here, it's just unequally distributed. And like we're in the future now, but most of the world's not. And that's normal, that's the way it works. And they will, if this space is as promising and fruitful as we think it is, it will expand and more people will join us here over time as the as meeting from both top down and bottom up as, 
as people grow and develop to be able to handle this way of, of being and as the tools become more sophisticated, better UX, more open. Right? Mm -hmm. Do you have a, um, so we're trying to build out these new organizations that sense and respond, like sense our, uh, our needs and respond to them appropriately. Uh, like I say, our web feed protocols are here to compete for our love, not to force us into paying them taxes. Uh, do you have just like basic do's and don'ts for DAO builders out there? They're like, hey, if you're if we're building out this DAO ecosystem and to be an actual new paradigm, not just a recreation of the old paradigm, do you have any just mm -hmm. like basic do's and don'ts for the DAO builders out there? Yeah, I think the the biggest one is um, just like take a breath and 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 when you when it, you want to get something done, the um, the the driving force will be to take something that you know from the corporate legacy kind of coordination system and just bring that in and apply that to the DAO and be like, look, maybe, maybe this DAO is not efficient enough. So let, let's implement some direct reports, you know, or, you know what, this DAO is not moving fast enough. It, it needs a strong leader. Like if you like, if, if you want to do that form of coordination, you can't, uh, you can create a, a company. Um, what I would say is like, like be open to the possibility that there are other alternative ways to work and to be, and DAOs are really suitable for that, but it is going to be confronting and it is going to be messy at times and it's not all figured out. You don't have to do that, but like the opportunity is there to try new things and to relate to people in a new way and to allow for the timeline to be a little bit messier in the product to take a little longer or whatever else happens, you know, in, in these spaces. I was doing a show with uh, treasure Dow uh, yesterday and they have like, they, they were one of the projects that came out of the loot ecosystem. Uh, mm -hmm. And they have like, a pretty insane. First off, their community is extremely energetic. So that you, so you, I know they're doing something right. Uh, and then I was, as I was unpacking their, their organization, I was like, okay, there's a lot of labor and talent here being coordinated. How do you guys coordinate everything as a DAO? And they said like, oh yeah, we've actually brought in like a lot of like web two project managers, like leaders into the DAO. Is that, is that like the old mentality or like where, how do you think about like top down project management inside of DAOs? Is that yeah. uh, antithetical or like, how does this, like, how, how does this fit in? Like, how, how does this become a component of DAOs? Well, I, I think DAOs are a big tent and like mm -hmm. they transcend and include the corporations. So you can, it's totally legitimate to do a web two style business in a DAO vehicle. That's fine. You can do that. Nothing wrong with that. Um, and you see that happening and that can be really successful and can provide a lot of good. And I think the, the, th the, the thing that we're all figuring out is there's also this new other web three native way to work and it's different and new and, and not as efficient sometimes because we're still learning it. And that's, I think like the most exciting and interesting place for me. And that's where I've tried to spend all my effort, but you know, teach their own, everyone, you have to meet people where they're at and different things are going to work in different times. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's like the possibility of, uh, when you, when you uh, say slime mold, DAO, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of something with absolutely zero epicenter. Mm -hmm. There's no center point and it's every, and to me, yeah. that's actually the original version of a DAO. A DAO has, in, in my mind, is misappropriately named in this modern day and age. Like we really have digital organizations rather than decentralized autonomous organizations. The only yeah. true like decentralized autonomous organization that I really think is out there, if you want to be a massive purist, it would be Bitcoin. Um, mm -hmm. Ethereum comes second, but there is still some central control. Uh, Uniswap comes to mind where it's code at the center and humans at the periphery. Um, yeah. but like there, but then if we wanted to get into like the DAO model that we kind of know of today of people in a discord making and doing and co contributing, do you think that's uh, actually possible to create a structure of a DAO where there is no actual central processing unit and is just slime mold as in like there's only labor at the margins there's only people at the periphery without any rules without any structure but the DAO somehow exists and thrives and grows from the collective labor of its like a beehive right a beehive without the queen like th is that even possible do you think that's possible I think it is I think it is and I'm not sure I think it's going to be one one of the different shapes that emerges and there's going to be value in all the different shapes so like the thing I often think about with this is like what is the governance scope? You know, what is this organism doing? What is the, what, what type of, and 
So like slime mold is good at certain tasks and a human being is good at certain tasks. And those are different spaces of tasks, right? So like, you know, Bitcoin is really good at certain tasks. And I loved Vitalik's article on uh, April 1st because like he made some really good arguments for why, you know, and, and they weren't jokes to me. Those were good arguments. Um, and like, that's great. And that's one way for, for what it does. That's the right thing. But if you're trying to, let's say, govern a complex group of many different individuals doing different types of work, like we don't have any way to make that an immutable smart contract right now. Um, you can governing an immutable smart contract, like the Uniswap V2 protocol, for instance, like there's a defined set of, of function calls that can be made. You can create an on-chain voting system with on-chain execution and have a single channel decision-making system, which is a kind of mind. Um, and you can have this big swarm of people that operate it, but that's not the same as Uniswap Labs, which is a group of creative workers organizing together to create a work product. That has a different governance method. I actually don't know how much about how Uniswap Labs works, but a lot of these types of central development companies, corporations work like normal companies where there's a leader and a hierarchy, and that's fine. Um, the opportunity and the place that I've spent my time is trying to figure out how do you govern in a decentralized way these groups of creative workers? And we like have some this fascinating potential there because once you figure that out, it breaks all of the limitations. Like it becomes that like beehive network, you know, where mm -hmm. actually we're yeah, you know, uh, some alpha leak for working on something like this, but eventually like it's not ready for disclosure yet. Um, it, it, it allows you to scale, like the prompt, the opportunity and the promise for like real decentralized work is I, I call it the, the party bike, like, you know, a party bike, it's like, a, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like 10 people can sit on it right. and you can pedal as much as you want. You can drink a beer, you know, one person steers, maybe they get bored steering, somebody else steers and you get somewhere cool. It's like, yeah. like imagine that for work. Like anybody right. can work as much as they want. They get the value out of it. Um, there needs to be a whole new set of uh, structures and decision-making processes in order to mm -hmm. enable that and support that. Yeah, uh, I actually intended on asking this next question before you talked about the little alpha leak. So for the record, uh, there's like been an explosion of like DAO tooling startups in mm -hmm. the last like six months. Like, and everyone is building something relatively similar to each other, a few differentiating yeah. points. Um, but like the number of, of these projects is like through the roof. I, I'm thinking that I'm thinking like there's over like 20 of these like Dow tooling startups going on at least, yeah. Yeah. uh, after like, what, do, what does, what is missing in the Dow tooling landscape that after like the dust settles with all these Dow tooling startups, what is the real problems that's getting solved? Like what, mm -hmm. uh, what is the project, the thing that Dow tooling is trying to get, get done, right? Or what is the next step for Dow tooling? Wow, man, there's a lot of stuff. Um. I think um, a lot of the DAO tooling that we're seeing, and I know a lot of the people working on these things and a lot of the projects, and I think they're awesome. Like there's some really great stuff. But like to the, going back to the thing we were talking about before, like a, a lot of it is taking processes that we know about from web two or the normal traditional corporate world and making ways to do them easily on chain in for decentralized communities. And that's great. But the un, the, the blue ocean, the, the, the undiscovered country is, what are the real web three native ways to work? Um, and there's very few tools that are really being made for that. Understandably, it's very, very new. And like self-shilling a bit, like I think Coordinate is one of them. Coordinate is, is uh, the only form of doing decent, fully decentralized compensation that I know of. And like understanding compensation is a huge challenge for really decentralized creative work. Um, like, how do you get paid? How do you share resources? How do you make those decisions? And, and the other side of that is the decision-making space itself, right? So we have on-chain coin weight, uh, token weighted voting, right? And we have snapshot and things like that. These things are great, but they're just single channel decision-making. It's like one thing, you put a proposal up, you people vote on it, make, but there's so many other types of um, computational social choice mechanics that are available and really important because there's all different types of decisions that need to be made in, de in decentralized ways, but also with the balance of centralization is good for some things, permissioning is good for some things, and decentralized and permissionless is good for other things, and to create tools that allow for a fluid 
movement, you know, with it that's accountable and transparent to create these structures. Like there's not really any tools that do that yet. What's the, um, what's the role of data when it comes to DAOs? Uh, a lot of DAO workers are individuals who have their own skill sets and their own like resume in working in web three and DAOs from, from as far as I can tell, don't have a way of sensing the uh, makeup of an individual worker. Uh, how do you think about this problem in the, in the DAO space? I think this is going to be a huge unlock. And I think Ceramic Network is amazing. I don't know if you've talked to those guys, like this idea of the dataverse where, you know, basically a blockchain for rich data. And what that allows for is like way more composable and uh, easy to start front ends. Like, um, you know, you you go to one dApp and you put in your profile and your 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 picture and whatever. And all of that is stored in IPFS through like, um, you know, these kind of, uh, shared data structures um, that then, you know, you open another DAP and your stuff automatically populates. Um, or, you know, you open a Kanban board at DWork, uh, which is an amazing, like, project productivity tool uh, startup, and you put in a bunch of tasks, and then you go to Clarity, which is another awesome tool, and those same tasks are there because they're both being stored through Ceramic Network on IPFS. Like, that type of data availability for rich data uh, for DAO workers is going to be like massively, massively expansive for the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and fits right into the theme of uh, DAO sensing and responding, right? Like DAOs yeah. can, can sense, sense their own needs and, uh, and then also sense who are the candidates that are best equipped for the DAO to give the DAO those needs uh, it, and, then, and, I think and then respond appropriately. I think this is actually one of the big pain points. Like um, in a lot of DAOs, and we talk to a lot of DAOs um, that they have the same the same problems. How do you uh, surface needed work? How do you create bounties? How do you um, know who's done what? How do you keep people accountable? How do you do offboarding? Like all of these, everybody has these same questions. And I think part of the problem is that without that data layer, that data blockchain. Um, you kind of have, you can't create, there's not a good enough shelling point for this stuff. Like you could create, there's a bunch of these different bounty systems, but because they don't interoperate um, and you don't have it all moving down to one data layer, like none of them's really gaining enough traction. But once we do have that, then it's gonna explode. And that's pretty soon. Okay, so this data layer is like a inter DAO communication layer. Is that a, a way to frame it? I think you could think of it that way, sure. Or like a, or it's a public good in a sense for for data that many you know front ends can bloom from, and you can have mm -hmm. like this is what will beat Facebook, right? Like you can't beat Facebook because of the network effect, but when every new profile can get stored in the same data structure that's open, you know, and uh, public good, then all of a sudden it's just going to start growing, you know, and then you don't have to have the one front end that you know, beats them all, you can have a thousand of them. Mm -hmm. uh, Trick, you you go out and, and go to real life crypto events. You're at ETH Denver. Mm -hmm. I saw you at NCON. I think you've been to a few others that I haven't been. Uh, and I believe if I'm remembering uh, your bio correctly, you also came from like a Web2 startup world, I think, maybe. I might be wrong about that. Not Web2, but I... Not Web2. Uh, trad, no. trad5? Trad, trad something? I was an artist and designer. Artist, okay, okay. Yeah. Anyways, same question. Uh, mm -hmm. Just the, the culture of the people that you in, in, engage with and interact with at, at these crypto events. What mm -hmm. about the culture? These these like Web three enabled individuals. Uh, what, what about the culture in these in real life events stands out to you as unique and compelling? Well, it's 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 great. It's um, the, at least the there's a bunch of different cultures in crypto, right? There's like finance culture. There's uh, investor culture. There's builder culture, there's DAO culture. And um, like, I didn't know anything about finance before I, I was an, I was an engineer and built code and engineering, various engineering projects, but um, finance I didn't know anything about. Um, that's not really my people in a way. Uh, not that there aren't plenty of them that I resonate with, but the people I really vibe with and that when I go to these conferences, I feel like I, you know, coming home in a sense is that there's people making DAOs, you know, that are that are trying to figure out really how human beings can collaborate. And this is something I've cared about my entire life. And this is like the most important thing that we can figure out on the planet because 
that is what makes or breaks like our ability as a civilization to thrive. Um, and they're not coming from there. It's very new thinking, you know, like very lots of polymaths and people with all the different information, bring it to share and work together. And it's very open, you know, it's very welcoming and not competitive, very collaborative. And it's that overwhelming nature of collaborative and open spirit that like, yeah, I'm a sucker for that any day. Mm -hmm. No. Why does this industry have all of these types of characters? Like what, what about this industry attracts that type? Yeah. So I think it, it, this goes to my kind of like developmental theory of organizations where, you know, before blockchain, um, you know, like a human being has these different levels of intelligence. We have like, um, survival instinct, you know, we have sexual instinct, we have, um, power we have heart we have our voice you know we have our, our intelligent our cognitive ability all these different layers and they all build on top of each other and in the same way organizations and societies has has that too and so it's like where are the jewels kept are the jewels safe and that's the first thing that we all need to think about am i safe and you know before blockchain um you had to trust the government and you had to trust the banks, you know, for that personal security. And that's not a very good trust situation. So everyone's kind of starting scared. You're all starting kind of scared. And so you can only mm. go so far. But when you have blockchain, you have this trustless coordination system to keep your jewels safe. And now, I mean, obviously, there's ways that they're not safe, but it's a lot better than we had before. And so what I notice is that from that much stronger foundation, like the other stuff can bloom. And like people, how many like handshake deals, like, oh, I'll send you some ETH, like send me the tokens later. Like that happens all the time. Like I was an entrepreneur. I started a bunch of companies. Everything was papered. Everything was contracts, lawyers everywhere. It's like, it's, we're way more, because of this trustless infrastructure, we're way more trusting because like the jewels are safe and that's profound. You know, that, that's, mm -hmm. that's changes everything. Yeah. Um, I think a, a lot of this world depends on assur assurances, right? Um, mm. We have like models of governments where we have slow, medium, and fast versions of government. Executive is, is the fast, Congress or the legislative is the medium, uh, and then the judicial, the Supreme Court is the slow. And this, the slow government is the hardest one to change, right? So when the Supreme Court says, this is the, the new v version of the law, this is the new law, uh, mm businesses and people have the Mac, like the strongest level of assurances that that is going to be the law moving forward because getting something overturned by the Supreme Court is like the hardest thing you can do in a country. Yeah. Uh, and so that gives businesses the assurances that they can operate on those laws and they can build around them and gives like startup founders assurances that they're not going to get rug pulled because the Supreme Court determined that this is the law. Uh, and I think what I, what I heard from you there is that like private keys give you just a new level of assurances over your assets that you've never been able to have before. Uh, and then like smart contracts give you assurances. And so, you know, uh, and, and I don't think that like, I'll be randomly sending somebody some ETH and telling them to just send me the tokens later, probably in 2040 when all of society is onboarded. And, but yeah. it's like the, this kernel, this, or in the, these first adopters who got attracted by this technology is probably a little bit more conducive to that. But I do take your point that like yeah. smart contracts and, and private keys and these assurances allow for the trustless base allows for a trusting uh, yeah. structure. Like a yes. trustless foundation allows for trust to be exhibited by the world at large because we don't have to, like you said, rely on the banks, rely on the governments or rely on the courts to get things right. Because even the courts can be gamed. Like yes. the courts is a gameable system where Ethereum is not. Uh, and so that that imbues whatever gets built on top of Ethereum as a more uh, uh, creative playground for trust to be exhibited. Absolutely, and and it, and it doesn't mean that we need to be we should be naive and not you know care about opsec or key management. You have to have that piece too, and you have to know right. that there are sharks out there, and it is and there are like it's really important to know what playing field you're on. Are you in an adversarial space? Are you in a collaborative space? You're in a creative space. You're a trusted space. Mm -hmm. What level is that? And then operate, you know, um, in that way. Mm -hmm. Dude, after after MCon, this this uh, stood out to me so much. Uh, after MCon last September, I think in Denver, yeah. September 2021, 
yeah. a bunch of us went out to just like a, a bunch of Airbnbs out in like the Colorado countryside just for like the weekend, just to get away, the sunlight, just walk around, just go on some hikes. Uh, and everyone kind of converged on one Airbnb, Airbnb as the meeting place, like the biggest one. And everyone had their stuff, like their backpacks with their laptops and their ledgers. And so everyone just dumped their backpack into this Airbnb and we all started going on a hike. Everyone had their ledgers in their backpacks and everyone just left all of their ledgers in the backpack and just in the Airbnb and no one thought twice about it. And I only knew about like 50% of the people in that group, but it was the Meta Factory. It was like half of them was the Meta Factory bros yeah. and, and ladies. Uh, yeah. And I was like, yeah, like no fucking way would any of these people like go into my backpack and try and find my ledger. Like that's not going to happen. And again, yeah. wouldn't do that in 2030 probably, but like with right. the particular people that Meta Factory of a particular DAO has created and just like the collaborative yes and culture of that, of that community and others, it just felt so I like no one thought twice about how like there is like millions and millions of dollars like collectively on these backpacks that are like laid on the ground. Yeah, it's amazing. And I think you're right. Like part of that is that it's still early. And part mm -hmm. of it is that, you know, there are high reputation people in this space that understand the substrate they were working on and and are able to trust each other, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, that notion of trust is one that I think about a lot, which is like. There's the impetus in the space often you see like everything needs to be trustless, everything needs to be trustless. And I think that's a great goal in many ways, but it's not reality because you can't, like there is still a hugely important space for interpersonal trust. Um, mm -hmm. and, and like that is where the like third mind, the mind between minds like really emerges, you know, in the collective intelligences between these interpersonal relationships. and. Yes, like those can be broken. And yes, that's okay. Uh. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to tell, I want to tell a quick story and it might actually be completely irrelevant, but I think your brain might pick up on something anyway. So I'm going to go and see what happens. Um, my first job out of school was working at a mental health agency for uh, kids that were deemed by the state to be unsafe to themselves, unsafe to others, or just like not functioning enough to be able to take care of themselves, like schizophrenic or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, to, and then, so this working, worked at this company for a while and we had a workshop, like a weekend optional workshop where we would be able to go and work with, um, just like hang around, uh, traumatized horses and horses are extremely emotional animals, right? Uh, if you like walk quickly towards a horse, it'll get scared and run away from you. Mm -hmm. But if you walk, uh, you know, passively and, and uh, like, you know, calmly, and not at a direct line to a horse, but like adjacently. And then you go and walk adjacently again, you get closer, then the horse is calmer in a, in a response to you. And so uh, they were the, the people that were leading these workshops were uh, getting us to like, okay, you're going to grab a horse and you're going to uh, lead it, right? You're going to walk with it. And the horse is going to determine whether it's going to follow you or not based on your body language, based on like the vibe that you give off. And I was watching one of the uh, therapists that was that was with us in this organization who was like you know, kind of a timid guy, uh, not not really too like, you know, confident. He would go up to the horse and like grab the reins and be like, uh, come on, horse, like we're going to go now. And the horse was like, what are we doing here? Like, yeah, fuck off, bro. Like, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, and like he couldn't get the horse to walk. Uh, and so like I was watching this happen and uh, I was like, OK, well, that's not what you do. And so when I did it, I went up and I grabbed the reins. I didn't look at the horse. I just like looked elsewhere and started walking. And the horse just immediately started going. And it's like, oh, okay, I guess we're going this way now. And the horse just started following me. Um, and then uh, just to, since I'm going into the story, uh, th this, this was a kind of a chaotic workplace. So some of these kids were like conduct disorder, like uh, not, re not really able to control themselves. And sometimes they would just like, aggressively act out and they were like between the ages of like 13 and, and 17 and there's this one kid who uh was having an act out moment and like starting to get a little violent uh and there was a moment where like i was engaging with him and i needed to like de-escalate the environment and but he was violent he was being aggressive being violent like trying to hit us and i like i can't remember what i said but i basically just turned or turned around and walked the other way to disengage but I'm turning my head away from this kid, so I don't know what he's going to do next. And so I turned away and, and started to walk away. And in the back of my head, I'm like, he's going to hit me. He's going to hit me. He's going to hit me. Uh, but because I acted as if I trusted this kid mm. and I acted as if I didn't think that he was going to hit me and I confidently turned away and walked away to disengage and he didn't hit me. And I was like, whoa, that guy didn't hit me. And so like, it's a, a lot of like our um, 
what we communicate is how we perceive the world is embodied in our actions, right? And so when we have a bunch of people in a Colorado countryside Airbnb and they're all leaving their ledgers on the ground, we're all indicating to ourselves like, hey, like this is, this is the vibe. Like this is the culture. This is the emotional like uh, state that I'm going to express that I think that we are in. And because I'm expressing that, everyone else also thinks that is true. Reflections on that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I think we, we, um, we create our own reality, right? Like, like I think if I, um, am acting from a place of, of confidence and, uh, openness and, um, you know, clear direction and integrity, it tends to create more of that in the world around me. And if I'm operating with a hidden fear in my system that I won't look at, that I'm going to get hit, that I'm going to get hit, get hit, gonna, I'm going to, I'm going to make that reality happen and somebody's going to hit me. Mm -hmm. Um, because we tend to, I mean, this goes to like spirituality and psychology and all these different wisdom traditions that we tend to recreate the same patterns in our lives over and over again. And, you know, there's this idea that, you know, the world is this concrete thing that has these specific rules and, you know, there's an order to it and it's kind of yes and no, you know, like really like reality is this kind of psychedelic experience that each of us is manifesting in our own way. And, um, and we can have the ones that are full of suffering and the ones that are full of, of less suffering. And each of those is just what we happen to need at that time. I'm not sure that's where you were going with that story, but no, there, there was no, I was going yeah. nowhere with it, but, yeah. um, uh, how do, how do, do you think DAOs are DAOs like an amplification tool for this kind of like behavior where if yeah. we, if the DAOs just assume that they trust us and we assume that we trust the DAO, like, do you think the DAOs can be like an amplification of just the, uh, the values that we want to see in the world? I think that they really are. And I think this is like, this development is going in concert, like at the same time as these collective super organisms are, are developing, so too are the parts, you know, the, within it, like each individual also has to develop. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that's one of the things that's like super exciting to me about it. Like working in a DAO that's not, you know, a company on the blockchain, even a company in the blockchain is going to push you in some areas, but working in a DAO that's, you know, really trying to push down us forward. Um, each person is going to be like their, their development gets amplified, I think. And, and you, you get these lessons and these, um, signals that help you orient to this new way it's like one of the biggest you know risk factors for being obese is having a lot of obese friend, friends yeah it's like mm -hmm. we we yeah. we do we garbage in garbage out like what's around us becomes us and so if you put yourself in a space with all these sovereign beings that are you know acting in these more developed ways like you will take those traits on and you will grow and you'll become more like them and DAOs become like a shelling point for that type of consciousness Trick, if we uh, zoom forward to like 2050, 2060, 2070, and we're got gray hair and old and DAOs are infinite at this point, uh, what do you hope your legacy is, you as an individual? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I just hope I help, you know, I hope <laughs> I help. <laughs> All right, and we're done. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I just hope, I... I I love working on this stuff. Like I, I love solving these problems and sharing them with people that I care about and, um, and co-creating this thing together and being part of this kind of movement. It like, it, it weaves together all of these things in my life that I care about. And I didn't even realize I didn't plan to get into crypto. Like I kind of got sucked in in 2020. Um, and it's because of all these different things, like this, Psycho, the psychology, the spirituality of it, the technology of it, the, you know, the revolutionary aspects, like, um, it's, it's so compelling. And so just to, uh, if my legacy is just, you know, someone that added some good to that system, that's, that's all I want. Um, Jake, you said you were an artist. Uh, mm -hmm. what were you an artist about? Like, what would you create? Um, interactive sculpture. So. I used, I used technology. So my training was in human computer interaction. I used to invent new types of computer interfaces, you know, physical interfaces, mostly using like, uh, mechanical engineering and electrical engineering and industrial design and software. 
And I did that in research for a while, um, trying to reinvent, you know, computers basically. Um, and then I started using it to make art. Um, I'd always made different forms of art in my life, but then I used that same material, but as an artist. So I made, um, sculpture. That's really cool. That just opened up a whole nother can of worms. Uh, uh, so when, when, uh, Gary Kasparov lost to, uh, deep blue, I think, yeah. or yeah. Uh, uh, people thought it was like, Oh, the chess is over. Like com the computers are won. like the art of chess is lost. What actually ended up happening is that the new frontier of chess came uh, with the grandmasters of the world, the Gary Kasparov's of the world, finding their preferred chess AI mm -hmm. and then com com competing with other grandmasters who have their chess AI. And so yeah. it started to become a human computer cyborg. Uh, and that it was the new frontier. And we've also seen this in online poker, too. Uh, it's gone from just individuals on a table playing poker to online poker where like the new meta is like how computer enabled can you be? Like you have scripts running to tell you about like probabilities and then you have to make the gut choice using that data. Uh, and I think there's a, a conversation to be had about this with DAOs too, uh, where DAOs are like the cyborg side of us that are doing like the smart contract basic stuff, uh, but it's still humans at the periphery. Um, do you have any thoughts about like the future trajectory of humans and the, the digital side of the world that we're creating? Yes, many. And I think that's, <laughs> yeah, I bet you do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like many, many, um, I think, um, technology is a part of the human organism, right? There's this idea and there's been this kind of misconception, I think that it's something external, you know, and that. And that when we're building these, like we need to build an AI that's outside of us and it's a mirror of us. But really the, the progress, the, the procession of technology is of, of identity creation. And, and like every, the phone becomes an extension of the mind. It's like a cognitive coprocessor. And, you know, just because it's not inside my skull doesn't make it any less me, you know? And I think you, people can feel that you lose your phone for a while and you feel huge sense of loss. Um, there's a, there's a phobia word for this. I don't know what it is, but there's yeah. a, a phobia word for if you do or without your phone. Yeah. And you know, I was talking to MetaDreamer about this the other day, actually. And, uh, like maybe what we're doing in DAOs is we're creating a AGI artificial general intelligence, because, um, if you think mu a lot of the, the progress in, in strong AI, you know, has been around, constructing these logical systems like it started Marvin Minsky gave a you know famously gave one of his uh, summer uh, students like the job of general computer vision in like the 60s like they figured that they'd be able to solve that in you know a summer in like the 60s um, but as realized that you know it is not this divorced logical system that can work on its own it's really a part of the human matrix and for then AI developers started to, they realized that it needs to be an embodied intelligence. They made robots and they thought that my robot body is going to, but again, this is outside of the human. And now you see like GPT-3 and whatever, they're really synthesis of human beings because they take all of the human output and they weave it together statistically into a new output, right? Um, in these kind of limited domains. But what are DAOs other than, you know, these aligning mechanisms for human output? that can scale and function more rapidly than any other human coordination system before. So eventually it might be that all of these different human actions are getting woven together through the technology of the DAO um, to become a real intelligence, you know, operating maybe not in a realm that we can directly communicate with, but taking action on the same realm, the same planet with us. Um, because that question, it's not outside you know, it is extension mm -hmm. of us. Uh. And, and there's, oh gosh, there's so many different directions to go in, but uh, we talked about the, um, the digital, like metaverse nomadic lifestyle that is now being enabled via DAOs. Yeah. Uh, and really just like this whole concept of crypto is always about freedom. Like the, the, the layer zero of crypto is freedom. Like if, mm -hmm. if crypto is here to do anything, it's to help us become more free. Like mm -hmm. Bitcoin and its 21 million hard cap is freedom from tyrannical monetary policy. Ethereum and smart contracts is freedom from like the, the capturing a financial system. Uh, and then like you know, NFTs is a freedom from just like, uh, I don't know, licensing and uh, uh, like labels and people that try to, to own the music industry in a, in a corporate sense. It all, it all sets you free. 
and and it's and that's really what technology has always been about is like how do we get how does technology allow us to access the things that we want more and that's always been what technology is and really i'm just seeing like DAOs as being just like another instantiation of ones and zeros that allow us to get what we want out of life even more um and so we have these ai developers that are building out these ais and i i, I love the what you said where they're trying to build it externally which is like naive because how can you build something external when you are the one actually building it in the first place? Like your biases, your values, your culture is being built into the thing that you are building. So there is no, even if you try to make it maximally external, you just can't pull the human out of the, out of the technology because it's the human that built it in the first place. That's why we have a, a layer zero podcast to talk about these subjects. Yeah. Uh, and so like, c can you talk about just like the, the importance of self-reflection about who we are as we build out these technologies and how, our own persons get in like uh, imbued into the technologies we create? Oh yeah, I mean, the most important question to ask is just what am I to start? Mm -hmm. You know, who am I, what am I? And, and, underst and understand the nature, the reality that we are in more and more. And then, you know, see that it's all a piece, you know, it is, it's divine uh, wisdom flow, life force energy flowing out into the, into the, into manifestation and, it's flowing through all, we're all a piece of that same thing of God, of this, you know, mm. the, the, uh, you know, the, the polarity of the universe and the, and the unity of it all. And that is going to flow through us into technology. It's going to flow through us into everything that we, that we make. And, you know, it, it reminds me, um, a lot of people sometimes think like, I think of it like the Vulcan fallacy or the Spock fallacy that you can have this purely logical uh, take on the world divorced from your emotions. And, um, the reality is, if you look at studies of split brain patients, like if you don't have access to your emotional system, then you cannot make any decisions. You know, there is no mm -hmm. lot, just logic without emotion. Like it all mm -hmm. flows from that same creative force and it flows up through all these different layers. So it's the same thing as thinking you could create like this AA that's AI that's outside of the human organism, because it's like saying it's outside of life and without life, it's just dead. It's just concept. Um, which is a part of experience, but not all of experience and experience cannot is irreducible to concept and vice versa. So, um, seeing it all is just, just this divine expression of the universe in action. Um, uh, I think really helps to better contextualize what it is that we're fucking doing in the first place. You know? mm. Uh, Trey, I think this is a, a good place to wrap it up, man. Thank you for coming on to layer zero and sharing your thoughts. Thanks. Thanks for having me, man. Great talking with you as always. Likewise, likewise. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.